Hey, what's up guys? Tyler here with Secure Team. Something has been discovered down on the moon. So throughout history, UFOs have been sighted by astronauts, astronomers, and civilians in outer space as well as here on the ground. What about all the sightings that have occurred on land? I think there has always been this social stigma that's been attached to people who have been able to record UFOs and actually believe in what they have recorded as something potentially unnatural or not of this earth. Tell me about the first time you noticed something strange in the sky above Dunny Dew. Well, I came out here in late uh, 2012 um, in August, and pretty much the second night that I was staying here, I noticed a strange ball of light moving across the house in the backyard, um, the property behind us, and it was moving very slow over the rooftops, and it was actually illuminating the rooftops underneath it as it was moving. This thing is phenomenal. It was just highly unusual, and this was around 11 p.m. in the evening. And um, in this town here, there's not many people are up at night. There's not many street lights. The, the town um, 
it prides itself on being one of the astronomy capitals of Australia um, because of the fact they have not much light, light pollution like in the city. So um, yeah, the second night I was here, I, I saw a very strange large spherical ball, which is half the size of the house, hovering above a house and then heading north, in the direction north, it was very unusual. So, um, and it just continued since then, um, unabated the sightings. Um, it's been, uh, a lot of people have seen it now, um, you know, up to 80 people have come up here and seen it from all around Australia. And um, it's just getting bigger and bigger in number, um, the, the actual eyewitnesses to what's going on. How long do you think it's going to take till people accept that these things are real? And how do you mean accept that what level of the population becomes, a, when it becomes a, a sociological, sociologically real? I don't know. How, when does it reach a level like that? It won't happen in Australia. That's what really scares me because what we're interested in is technically not normal. And as Damien told you, he almost attract, attracted a psychiatric label for filming what he's seeing. So they're implying it was a hallucination, but he's filming it. To me, you're attracting a decent case of medication if you think I can film my hallucination. But, but a doctor can suggest that with a straight face. That, that to me is really scary. Because this, this, is, this is aberrant belief, an aberrant belief system. We're on the fringe of society. This is an outlier belief system. This is insane what we're talking about. But tell me what is sane. Well, sane is being a robot, taking your brain out and just going to work and doing and never thinking outside the box. That's how they classify sanity. Never actually think. And, but none of us are running around like headless chooks. We're, we're holding down jobs and mortgages and blah, blah, blah. So we're not completely, completely nuts. But our belief system is nut, nutty enough to actually look up into the sky. And, and Damien's made it even more dangerous because he's filming something that's not supposed to exist. While it's been widely discussed that UFOs are of an alien nature, uh, we are starting to realize that many of these may also be man-made. What is secret space theory and what are your findings on the topic? When you talk about secret space theories or secret space ideas, uh, you're really talking about two different things here and they're, they're both valuable, they're both important. Uh, but we're really talking about conventional secret space operations and unconventional secret space operations. So let's, the conventional first, um, look at it from a military point of view and that of particularly of the United States military, which looks at space as a necessary theater of operation, a necessary platform that must be dominated by them. If they're going to dominate any theaters of operation on the surface of earth, they must control space. It's absolutely essential. All those smart bombs, smart missiles, weapon systems that are highly technological rely on satellite information being fed to them, providing them with all kinds of data, maps and telemetry information and so forth. And so you must have dominance in space if you're going to have dominance on the surface of this planet. Uh, every military power on this globe knows this fact. I think it's important to have serious historians like Richard Dolan uh, who can really look into the UFO phenomena and the history behind it and we're going to look into some of that history today. The YB-49 was the first vector-shaped jet engine equipped aircraft to successfully fly our airspace in 1947. Of YB-49, the huge 100 ton dreadnought packs 32,000 horsepower in its eight jet engines. At the controls during the initial flight are veteran test pilot Max Stanley, center, and crew of two. Theirs is a big job, and like a giant boomerang, the mammoth craft picks up speed. Trailing streams of smoke from its jets, Uncle Sam's latest ace of the atom age passes its test with flying color. The YB-49. It was a successor to the YB-35, which used propellers to navigate the skies and a precursor to the B-2 stealth bomber. The Convair Kingfish reconnaissance aircraft design was the ultimate result of a series of proposals designed as a replacement for the Lockheed U-2. Kingfish competed with the Lockheed A-12 for the Project Oxcart mission and lost to that design in 1959. 
the Lockheed Have Blue was the code name for Lockheed's proof of concept demonstrator for a stealth bomber. Have Blue was designed by Lockheed's Skunk Works division and tested at Groom Lake, Nevada. The Hav Blue was the first fixed wing aircraft whose external shape was defined by radar engineering rather than by aerospace engineering. The aircraft's faceted shape was designed to deflect electromagnetic waves in directions other than that of the originating radar emitter, greatly reducing its radar cross-section, keeping it secret in space, a precursor design to the F-117. Over the years, as the United States' technological progress advanced, so too did their military arsenal. This arsenal has been tested in the field of battle, like the Vietnam War, and of course in the Middle East from the 80s up until recently. Not every citizen of the public is exposed to the modernization of our military craft, but there are those who have worked inside our military who have watched firsthand the development of incredible secret aerospace technologies evolve over time. One such individual who has firsthand witnessed the feats of our own technology is a man by the name of Jim Goodall, former Air Force man spooky airplane researcher and friend of former director of Lockheed Skunk Works, Ben Rich. Jim is an extremely experienced individual when it comes to the hidden history of secret aircraft. He blew the lid on Area 51, and as a photographer, he's uncovered the hidden history of test aircraft before they were public knowledge. This is the shape of the F-117. It's an arrowhead. I don't know if it's being lit up or whatever. And this was given to me by an F-117 crew chief. This is the actual RAM, radar absorbance material, used on the F-117. I said, can I go to jail for that? And they said, no, no, the technology has changed so much. You know, this is 40, this is 40 years old. It's old technology. And that's the other thing you got to take in consideration when you see programs that are being declassified or talked about. They're talking about stuff that may, may have flown and program came to an end, all the tooling destroyed 20 or 30 years ago, and we're just finding out about it today. I'm, I'm a historian. That's probably why I do what I do. I'm a historian. I'm an aviation historian. I'm a military historian. And I figure as an American taxpayer, you're spending my money on our defense, which is the proper thing to do. Whatever they but I should have, if I ask a question of my government, I expect an honest answer. I don't expect to get a runaround. If, the, if it's not classified or what, if what, the part I'm asking about is not classified, then damn it, I expect an answer. I don't expect a runaround. I worked on the A-12 early in the program, which is the predecessor to the SR-71. It's the single place CIA funded and operated Blackbird. They were flight tested and based out of Area 51, but they were operationally, they flew out of uh, Kadena Air Base, Okinawa. 
That's the same place the SR-71s operated after the, the A-12s were replaced by the SR. I worked in NAV system, but primarily telemetry. So that's the primary reason I was, I was at Edwards. And one of the reasons I, you know, I flew into Area 51 is to install some more additional telemetry equipment. The stuff I was working on wasn't classified. The programs that were monitoring were. There would be flight testing for the XB-70, the YC-141 Starlifter, and of course the Blackbird. And on May 30th, 1967, Mel Vavadich flew the first A-12 from Area 51, air refueled twice, and flew from Area 51 in central Nevada to Kadena, Okinawa in five hours and 29 minutes. If you're gonna take a commercial airliner today, it'll take you 17 or 18 hours for that same flight. Uh, Mel was the first guy to fly an operational mission. And that was on uh, May 30th, 1967. It would, the last flight was on the 21st of June, 1968, and it wasn't until the fall or early winter of 1988, 20 years after he was retired, that they admitted to the existence of the single place CIA version of the Blackbird referred to as the A-12. So if we go back to the early history of aeronautics and we look at some of the craft that have been created and built uh, by the military industrial contractors over the years. Many of them have taken on the shape of a boomerang, uh, a V, or dare I say a triangle. You're going to have a militarization of space and you're absolutely going to have a uh, kind of natural escalation of weapons like an arms race in space and that's going to require a significant classified component of that militarized space and so that's that is a secret space program and there is no argument against this whatsoever like everyone knows that this is the case we've got the nro the national reconnaissance office for example which has been operational since 1960 and they have had a significant uh presence in space that's almost completely not almost is completely classified we have essentially zero uh, real tangible information about what the NRO is doing, or the most bare bones stuff, that's all. And, you know, you've got the Navy, you've got the Air Force, all of which, both of which have classified space elements. And now with a unified uh, space force, that's all going to be reorganized. And But you're going to have massive classified components to all of this. So that's a conventional way to look at a secret space program. And that will incorporate, uh, you know, probably some very interesting technology on the satellites in terms of optics, maybe in terms of even their ability to maintain orbit for long periods of time. Uh, you know, I mean, you've got the, uh, the X-37B, which is a kind of a militarized version of a space shuttle. And all of those missions are highly classified. We know a little bit about what the X-37B does, is capable of but we don't really know what the missions are. We're not really informed of that. So there's a lot of elements of a secret space program that are no great shakes, at least from, they're not going to transform our worldview. But then there's the other element of a secret space program that people often really want to know about it, which involves, let us say, unconventional and unacknowledged activities and science that are not supposed to exist. And that involve what we would call UFOs, all right? So that's where it gets a little more interesting, perhaps. I had a dear friend just pass away. He is a re retired SR-71 pilot named Dave Fruhoff. And Dave uh, retired as lieutenant colonel. I'm talking with Dave, and I said, said Dave, said, Dave, do you believe in UFOs? He said, absolutely, positively, they do exist. He said, I was flying a night training mission in an SR-71 out of Kadena, Okinawa. I was in the far western Pacific. We were at 
78,000 feet, 77,000 feet at Mach 2.7. We're going straight. It's 11 o'clock at night. And we're, we're sort of heading our way back towards, to, towards Kadena. It was a three quarter moon. And all of a sudden, uh, Dave said he got a glint of something metallic five or six miles off to his, off to his right and maybe four or 5,000 feet above him. So he contacts Kadena on Secure Voice, he said, do we have another bird up? He said, you'd know if we did. You were at the briefing, no, you're the only one up there. He said, no, I'm not. So I'm gonna go take a closer look. His backseater said, hey, Dave, we have company. He said, yeah, I'm gonna go see who it is. So he moved, pushed, he advances the throttles, about a 10 degree bank, and he's climbing and he's heading towards this object. He's still getting glints off of edges. It's not circular shaped, it has sharp edges, and he's getting glints and it's metallic or it's shiny. He figured when he was about a mile or two away from this object and still a couple thousand feet below it, it accelerated at about a 30 degree angle of attack and left him in the dust. About 85,000 feet to 180,000 feet, I mean, Boom, I mean, he was, it was like he was ha heading in the opposite direction. He figured it was going at least eight to 10,000 miles an hour. In 1978, cosmonaut Pavel Popovich claimed he saw a sparkling white object in the shape of an equilateral triangle flying at about 10,000 meters above Earth. I think it's amazing uh, the way that NASA and other aeronautics industries have been able to hide this, this strange alien or UFO phenomenon from the general public for so many years. And on that side of it, what I would say is that, you know, we don't have we don't have firm authenticated proof we don't have an admission from the government from the military from any of those people that says yes there are ufos out there or we have constructed a element of our space program to deal with ufos that are out there however what we can say is that there are enough pieces of testimony and evidence and anomalies that have been recorded in Earth orbit that, or beyond, frankly, that strongly indicate to a rational observer that something really odd is going on out there that is not supposed to be happening by any standard of understanding or science that we have. So that's that's where you start getting into, is there a secret space program that is connected with the UFO phenomenon? And I personally think that the answer to that is there absolutely is. And the real question is, how far does it go? What are the, what are the real contours and parameters of this presumably very secret classified space program? And that's where, you know, I don't know anyone who actually knows the full dimensions of how far it goes. In other words, do we have uh, black triangles that can go beyond Earth orbit to a nearby planet or the moon or something like that? I mean, there are people who make this claim. Or do we have uh, replicated alien tech um, in terms of, you know, like the legendary ARV, the Alien Reproduction Vehicle? Did we actually make that? And does that go, has that gone throughout the solar system? But we, we, don't, we don't have proof of these things, but we have our stories. And some of them are pretty darn interesting. And some of them are maybe believable to those of us who've looked into it. But we're in an area of what I would say making informed speculation based on genuine knowledge that we have, but we don't have the full picture. So we get some information and at least at this point, make some inferences and maybe put together some interesting hypotheses about what's going on.
as you watch, notice all of the different signs of triangular or TR-3B-like objects in all of the mission patches and NASA imagery. NASA's meatball insignia is far from the only example of official space program symbology that blatantly engages in this kind of vector warship. This is NASA's official seal, which was also designed back in the late 1950s at the same time as the meatball insignia, created for what NASA describes as usage in more formal settings. Note how the layout of the official seal also allows the vector symbol to feature prominently. It should be considered very interesting that NASA is by no means the only space agency on Earth that adopted some variation of this vector symbology as a primary element to include in their official insignia and seal designs. These are the official insignias for Roscosmos, Russia's new federal space agency established in 1992. The overt inclusion of the vector symbology is rather obvious here. Likewise, in the case with the official logo for StarSim, the joint Russian-European organization that, since 1996, has run the ultra-dependable Soyuz rocket program. Established in 1996, the Chinese National Space Administration and their primary contractors, the Chinese Aerospace Corp, both decided to employ the vector as the main component in the design of their official insignias too. The Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency also felt it prudent to ensure the vector symbology featured heavily in their design. The official insignia of the Canadian Space Agency made sure to include the requisite vector warship as well, as did the NSP the ISRO, India's Space Research Organization, so did the Belgians, the French, and the Swiss. South Korea could not avoid including a variation of the vector either, and neither could the new UK Space Agency, German Aerospace, Turkey, Malaysia, Ecuadorian Civilian Space Agency, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and even Bulgaria. All those space agencies from around the globe decided to include some variation of this particular symbology in their official insignias. And paying homage to an old American hypersonic wing design from the late 1950s is absolutely not the reason this global vector veneration exists. Are you starting to see the pattern? Over the decades, the various manned space programs have also been compelled to find ways of incorporating the vector into the design of their official insignias, seals, logos, and patches. The official patch for Russia's old space station. This is the official insignia for NASA's famed Apollo Lunar Landing Program. For example, the official insignia of NASA's STS space shuttle program is comprised of more than one representation of subtle vector symbology. Many of the individual mission-specific patches for the STS program have also incorporated some variation of the vector into their designs. Here are just a few of the many examples. Since 2000, the various long-duration expeditions to the International Space Station have also not been able to avoid the use of the vector symbol in their official mission insignias. Sometimes the symbology is displayed quite overtly, and sometimes it is buried in design subtly. See how the shape of the book's open pages, as well as the rays of the sun, both create and disguise the vectors? Nonetheless, whether sweeping or straight-edged, blatant or subtle, this V or inverted V symbology, in some shape or form, is there.
Since their earliest days, NASA has ensured that the Vectors served a dominant symbolic role in their manned space project insignias. It should be obvious by now that NASA and virtually every other space agency on Earth have a clear infatuation with this shape. And it is also worth noting that it is not only the civilian space sector that blatantly worships some variation of this vector symbology. In the military realm, the U.S. Department of Defense makes use of this symbology over and over again in their many space-related programs. Again, here are just a few examples. Notice the strange and mysterious vector-shaped UFO reflected in the astronaut's visor. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. My name is Alara. Um, I kind of woke up to the ET presence and I would say got activated in late 2017 when I had a close encounter with a, a spacecraft that was about 50 feet in front of me that decloaked in front of me. Uh, after that happened to me, uh, I started going to UFO events and conferences and so forth trying to seek out other experiencers and begin to get some understanding of what happened to me and what the truth was about this planet, what was going on here. So in uh, 2019, I went to contact in the desert in Indian Wells, California. And when I was at that event, I decided to go to the CE5. I think it was on a Friday night. I went to that CE5 event um, and a lot of kind of unusual things happened that night that I was not expecting to happen. Um, during that CE5 event, I did see a couple of ships phase in and phase out in the distance, uh, lots of like act activity like that, but what was very interesting was that there was a very heavy military presence there uh, throughout the entire evening. And I kind of was puzzled as to why, because I didn't see that much activity to justify that kind of military presence. Um, there was one really unusual event that happened that night while I was at that CE5. There was these two... Um, there was these two, I, I don't know how to describe them, except they looked like butterflies that were on fire. They were very unusual. And I've never seen or experienced anything like this. Um, they sort of phased in and phased out probably two, three times. And uh, they, when they phased in, they would dance and they were kind of, they had the whole crowd in awe. The crowd was just tripping on, on these, these butterfly UFOs. And they were dancing and then they would phase out. Anyway, it was a pretty intense experience. Um, and at one point I kind of felt a lot of different energies over that field. I, I, I sensed what I believe were, were cloaked ships above that field, but I didn't, of course I didn't see anything like that. So I ended up leaving the event. I think it was around 11 o'clock at night. I left by myself, got in my car. I was staying at a hotel about two miles away that night. Um, when I was driving to the hotel, I noticed this really bright white light in the rear view mirror. So I was about a mile away from the hotel at the time. I drove to the hotel parking lot. I parked my car and I got out my phone and I started taping this white light. Um, and it was a ship and it was sitting above that field uh, at the CE5 that I just left where there was nothing going on. I remember thinking, I wonder if anybody at the field can see what I'm taping right now because it was really bright and it was very significant. So I, I was taping that for about 30, 35 minutes. It was there for quite a while just sitting above that field. And at a point I ended up going back into my room and playing the footage back. Well, when I played the footage back, I noticed there was a TR-3B sitting there cloaked above that ship, above the field, the entire time.
uh, and that kind of blew my mind actually. Uh, what I thought was really significant about that was number one, that my phone picked this up, but I didn't see it with my naked eye. I thought that was interesting. I also thought it was interesting that here, if you really look closely at the footage, it looks like there's more than one, although one stands out far more than the other. So um, I thought it was significant also that there was a TR-3B craft, whether there was one or two, sitting above the field of a CE-5 event at a major UFO conference. I thought that's kind of spoke volumes about what's going on here. And so um, if you ask me, I think that there, I think that we've back engineered alien technology. I think uh, our secret space programs have really super advanced stuff that they back engineered. And I think they're hiding it from the population. And I think they're able to do this because all of these craft can cloak to our naked eye. Also, it occurred to me later that those two butterfly UFOs that were on fire, that perhaps those that I was right about my intuitive hit on those and maybe those were a projection coming from one of those cloaked ships above the field. Here we have a clip from a man named Eric that was filmed on September 7th, 2021 of an obvious triangular TR-3B shaped object with three distinct lights on each corner. He says that it was captured in Northwest Pennsylvania. He said that the object looked longer than others and was very low and has a very low deep tone that is obvious when the object was going over because of how different it was and sounded compared to other aircraft. Here we have an almost identical object to the clip that you just saw with white glowing lights on each corner forming a triangle that seems to be moving steadily and silently as it passes above and finally fades off into the darkness. The man who recorded this, Joe Wall from New Hampshire, said, quote, I made a little compilation where the original video plays first, then with it zoomed in and slowed. I thought it was pretty insane. That whole town kept losing power that night as well. It would go off and back on. Couldn't even use my debit card at the gas station. I stayed at a hotel right there. Here's a clip from a man named Mark Klein that was filmed above his home where he was doing some sky watching and filming in infrared, recording the stars and seeing what he could capture. At first, we see a satellite as indicated in the video. And then as indicated with the arrow, we then see a distinct triangular pattern of lights, this time emitting more of a blue tinge, but nonetheless flying in a perfect triangular formation, silently passing overhead with the trees in the foreground. And some of you may be asking, well, why is it that if these are solid triangular craft, are we able to sometimes see stars through them? 
one of the main theories regarding some of the technology used within these vehicles is a cloaking ability that essentially puts a mirrored image around the object of everything that is surrounding it, hence giving you a view as if you are looking straight through the object. In this amazing clip, we have another object that is extremely similar to one of the earlier clips we showed of another one of these triangular formations of lights moving in a perfect synchronized fashion as if the lights are locked in with one another. The man who captured this, Michael Serrata, said, quote, I captured footage of a huge triangle formation or possibly a single object two months ago. I have since filmed other triangular UFOs similar to this object, but are different triangle-shaped formations. And as the clip starts, we see a few objects moving through space, and we can see laser pointers being used to attract the attention of whatever these unknown objects are. And so as they were focusing their laser pointer on the one object towards the center of the screen, they completely miss what comes next, what appears to be nearly identical to the earlier clip where we have this time three fiery red glowing lights to the right of the screen moving upwards to the northwest where you can almost make out the angle of the way the object is being viewed by the distance and the way the lights look from the brightest light being closest to the camera and the furthest and smallest light a little more hard to see in the background as if the object is tilted. Here you're seeing an enhanced version of the formation of fiery red lights that once again could be a formation or could simply be a solid craft using some sort of cloaking technology. Here is a recent clip taken above Shanghai, China in June of 2021, where bystanders on the ground were shocked to see this solid, sharp-edged black triangle sitting silently in the sky, moving slowly through the clouds of Shanghai. Here we have what the viewer called a stingray-like triangle object that was captured in the skies over England on August 16th, 2021. In 2004, the United States Navy applied for a patent to produce a triangular craft that looks a lot like the TR-3B, and its propulsion system could be something completely different than what the original TR-3B supposedly operated on. My name is Edgar Rochelle Fouché. I'm here to speak about secret government technology, reverse engineering of alien artifacts, 
and the top secret MJ-12 committee. Forum 3, you'll know exactly what the flying triangle is, the one that's been sighted around the world. It's the most exotic and classified aerospace vehicle that's ever been built. It may be stealthily hovering over Phoenix, Belgium, or your city. The company in question was involved in developing the TR-3B gravity disruption device called the magnetic field disruptor, which is the circular accelerator part or the TR-3B, which I'll go into more detail in a minute. So I first learned about Ed Fouché back in 2004. I was just doing some research on anti-gravity and I found a, a, an old presentation called The Case for Anti-Gravity. And uh, right towards the end of that, they had mentioned Ed Fouché and quasi-crystals and metamaterials, um, which I started looking into, found, you know, Ed Fouché's, you know, original presentations from IUFOC in 1998, this idea of rotating mercury plasma engine. And so I started making a couple of videos on the physics ideas behind this anti-gravity mercury, spinning mercury centrifuge engine and that whole gem theory thing. And that caught the attention of someone who knew Ed Fouché a guy named Ella McCoy, who had a YouTube channel um, back in the day, but he put me in touch with uh, Ed Fouché. The rest of this video, although not complete, is a list of man-made advanced propulsion, or as those of us in the know like to call them, alien reproduction vehicles. I'm going to go over a few known examples of these, and how to differentiate between them and actual alien vehicles, those produced and flown by extraterrestrial entities. The first on our list is the TR-3B Flying Triangle, which is the craft we see in the first ever episode of X-Files. This craft was the first ever prototype ARV to use the superfluid anti-gravity centrifuge engine. It looks like they built the engine first and then came up with the aircraft design to build around it to make it fly. If you notice, the fluid is rotated inside of a small semispherical container located at the center of the craft. Since the TR-3B uses an accelerator with a small radius, it only succeeds in eliminating 85% of the total weight of the craft. Thus, the rest of the lift is provided by three thrusters at each corner of the triangle, similar to the PV-704's use in the Avricar propulsion drive, only these run on liquid oxyhydrogen. These serve to stabilize and control the flight of the craft, as well as a portion of the lift. Stabilization and direction is a key design problem with craft that utilize a superfluid, superferrofluid anti-gravity engine. So note the three stabilizer units mounted on the underside of these other craft. These are most likely some sort of specialized gyroscopes, but they also could be some sort of wave amplifiers, as Bob Lazar suggests. Either way, their function is more or less the same, stabilization and direction. You can tell by the fact that there are three of them. It appears that they also double as tripod landing gear. Brad Sorensen produced this drawing of an ARV, or alien reproduction vehicle. Here are some other photographs of similar craft, which in my opinion are all man-made products of the secret government. To me the most fascinating vehicle from the Aurora program has been the TR-3B. It's a triangular shaped vehicle. It uses a circular accelerator, as you imagine a circle within a triangle, that rotates a mercury-based plasma at 60,000 revolutions per minute, pressurized at 250,000 atmospheres, and supercooled to 150 degrees Kelvin. I absolutely believe that all the triangular-shaped vehicles that have been spotted or belong to the U.S. government. He does come from an, a background of, you know, intelligence. And he did te teach me a lot about, you know, how in the intelligence works in the military and how these special access programs and how all the funding and the contracting and all that stuff really works. Uh, he did teach me an, an incredible amount about, you know, how that stuff, you know, really functions behind the scenes. But it also helped me, you know, verify a lot of what he was saying. First off, we asked T.D. Barnes if Bob Lazar ever worked out at Area 51, and his answer was straight out no. And he was former special projects manager out at Area 51 for almost a decade. When I asked him if Ed Fouché, if he could, you know, ask around and tell me if Ed Fouché worked out there, his response back was, I can neither confirm nor deny whether Ed Fouché worked out at Area 51. And that kind of, you know, confirmed it for me when T.D. Barnes said, you know, he can't confirm nor deny whether Ed worked out there. That was like, 
well, that means he worked out there, you know? What was it about his explanation of the physics of the supposed TR3B that piqued your interest and, and made you think, hmm, maybe there's something here? The thing that interested me first was that there was a couple different sources talking about this rotating, you know, rotating superconductors research was just coming out. A lot of that research was being done at NASA at the time and was coming out um, through American anti-gravity uh, around the same time. So we were learning about NASA's research with rotating superconductors, the, the Russian Podklitnov and his rotating superconductor experiment. And so I thought that there might be some sort of connection between you know rotating superconductor anti-gravity research and this idea of a rotating mercury based plasma and so i began investigating that connection first and that's what drew me to initially to the, the propulsion technology side of it but then the the mention of quasi crystals and metamaterials and all the interesting scientific literature I started finding when I began researching those topics made me instantly realize that, you know, this was, you know, metamaterials are used for invisibility technology. And that then I started, you know, realizing all the technology that, you know, the, all the research that has been done out at Area 51, Project Rainbow and all this other stuff. And I, and I was able to confirm that a lot of those, uh, these materials were in fact, you know, something special and that, you know, some ordinary staff sergeant from the military knowing about these things there was something you know maybe something more there because it wasn't something that your average person talked about in 1998 no it was virtually unheard of in, in fact um, a lot of the physics literature you can't find a lot of metamaterials you can't find a lot of stuff in the literature on metamaterials or quasi crystals before in 2002. And then Fouché was talking about these things in 1998, nearly four years earlier. So that sort of, you know, really made me say, wow, you, this is something you should be paying attention to and, and, and looking deeper into. When I started researching quasi crystals, you know, I realized that the guy who discovered quasi crystals, Dan Schechtman, did his postdoc after receiving his materials degree in material science from Technion University in Israel, he went and did his postdoc at Wright Patterson. So um, at the Wright State Materials Command, which is the exact place where, you know, we'd expect these sort of alien materials to be, you know, to be present and being analyzed. So I thought that that was a very interesting connection that the scientist who discovered quasi crystals did some work connected to Wright Patterson Material Command on icosahedral phase crystals and stuff. So it was it was quite interesting um, to, to learn about that. Then, of course, if you research all this, the history of metamaterials, you'll find that these were developed pretty much at Area 51 was a, a lot of the, the pioneering research into metamaterials and nuclear magnetic resonance and EMF response. Those those technologies were pioneered at Area 51. Again, meta metamaterial is a, is an interesting word. It's basically a, a metamaterial for the layman is a material that gains its resonant or response properties through its structure, not through its composition or what it's made of, but by just the natural structuring of the, of the actual material. So it was discovered that grids, for example, had a different response or um, things with sharp edges had a different response than smooth edges and rounded edges, which is why you see all those sharp edges on the F-117 stealth fighter versus, you know, the, the round edges on the fuselage than the quasi crystals, because that was some deep insight into some interesting information and how he knew about that and how he was aware of those technologies. Um, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. And I, you know, I think it might've been, he, he might've knew Hal Putoff and might've gotten the information through Hal Putoff. That was one contact I know that he had because he talked about Hal Putoff um, and actually had his email and, and put me in touch with Hal Putoff uh, years ago at one point. So I know that he had some of these contacts who were into this black world physics stuff. So a quasi crystal is, is a, a periodic crystal it has a different phase it has re recurring symmetries but it doesn't have uh, innate symmetry at the basic level it has a more complex uh, symmetry shape so there 
were originally thought not to exist. In, in fact, uh, one of the most famous scientists of the day, Linus Pauling, you know, once famously claimed there's no such thing as quasi crystals, only quasi scientists um, making a, you know, a direct, you know, jab at Daniel Schechtman, who's of course the, the scientist that made this discovery and won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of quasi crystals. Also quasi crystals have very amazing optical properties which is one of the one of the main things that I, I took note of and started researching when I first found out about them for instance um, researcher from Princeton New Jersey Eric Quinone showed that you could bend fiber optic signals at 90 degree angles without losing signal quality so basically you can base you can build photonic computers out of quasi crystals and metamaterials and build waveguides that would use light in a um, and photonics in a, in a type of advanced circuitry. So that was what I first saw and started learning about when I first researched these things back in 2004. And I immediately, you know, realized that, you know, we're dealing with um, something very close to alien technology and what I would believe alien technology would look like, uh, you know, describe as, as, as we, we think of it engineered down to the atomic level a rotating, a pulsating red light in the middle. We also talk about an object that had a vertical development. Those who could see it from the side saw a dome, a dome on, on the top of it. And in this dome, there were windows. In my opinion, uh, it didn't have any influence at all on all the witness reports which were done before. Uh, so it has no influence, in fact, on the Belgian wave. But it's very unfortunate that we have shown this photograph as being the uh, brand of the Belgian wave, as being the object that has been operating above Belgium. So what kind of aircraft were being developed in the late 1980s that could explain that Belgian wave of UFO sightings? Because I've had a number of people that have watched my videos on the TR-3B and, and came and said, listen, I had a sighting, I saw this craft and there's nothing else that looks like it except this TR-3B thing that you're talking about. Uh, nothing else that can describe accurately what I saw. Um, so there is a lot of research that's being done in ufology into what kind of craft were being developed during that time and could they explain this or was it, you know, a wave of visitors from outer space that were responsible um you know where, what are the origins of that craft and, the, and, and that people were seeing in those sightings so we did look back to you know northrop grumman and that 1991 popular mechanics article on the tr3a because we have a tr3a it's a real it's it's apparently there's blueprints on it there's a whole there's a contractor northrop grumman that developed the tr3a so that led us to thinking, oh, well, TR-3B has got to be another Northrop Grumman craft because, you know, it's just one letter off. But then I talked to Ed Fouché and he said, no, um, he didn't think that Northrop Grumman was the contractor, that they had used the TR-3A and changed the letter to make it, you know, similar um, so that it would throw people off as, a, you know, another another layer here of, uh, of secrecy to throw people off. So. It's hard to say. We have never found, you know, at blueprints or, you know, con a contractor or anyone come forward that said they've worked on these massive space platforms um, that are apparently these 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 platforms were developed for a secret space program, uh, specifically as, you know, transport vehicles to shuttle, you know, men and cargo to and from space um, to secret space platforms and locations. Of course, you know, again, the evidence for this is is uh, is where we where we um, we're lacking. We're lacking to, as as a definitive proof to show that you know this is what's really going on. But these are some of the stories that you know have come out of this. So, typically, aircraft uh, lettering is you know the the letter stands for what its purpose is. Like F is for fighter, B is bomber. You know, um, so TR tactical reconnaissance would follow that you know nomenclature certainly but um again this is where ed fouché says that we step outside the normal zone into the twilight zone and things are a little different in the, in the black world but again this 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 speculation 
is, is just speculation because we don't have um, a military classification. Uh, we have some, we know that, you know, physicists were working on nuclear powered aircraft as early as the 1960s. In fact, Stanton Friedman um, apparently worked on some of these you know, nuclear powered aircraft as well. Um, you know, famous UFO researcher Stanton Friedman, which I thought was interesting. And I sent you that info on the, that other um, nuclear powered aircraft that they were thinking about and conceptualizing back in the, in the 70s. Um, but of course, treaties uh, outlawed the use of nuclear weapons in space and on airplanes. So, um, you know, if, if research continued with nuclear powered aircraft, it would have had to be done in the complete black world where it, will, it would never, you know, see the light of day because that, of course, would violate international treaties. And, um, you know, so the TR 3B is basically like an illegal craft. And, and if it does exist or ever did exist, then chances of it being declassified are almost zero because it isn't it, because it violates in you know international treaties uh for nukes and, and airplanes <laughs> so it's it's kind of like this dilemma craft it's it's not like the sr-71 or the a a12 or the f-117 where it, you know after a couple of years of be being out there uh it's going to turn from a you know black world craft to a you know where they have to admit to it and and show it off I don't think we're ever going to get that day where they roll one of these TR-3Bs out of the hangar and show it off to the public. I don't think that that would ever happen, even if it were the case. The person who founded and created the Lockheed Skunk Works was Kelly Johnson. His right-hand man was Ben R. Rich. Ben uh, was an aeronautical engineer. He was a thermodynamist. He's, uh, I think he was originally from England. I think I met him at a, at a conference and talked to him and asked him, you know, could I call you? Uh, and he was very, you know, he was very obliging. And we just started up a conversation and it, it grew to the point over 25 years that we spoke approximately once a quarter. If I didn't call him, he called me. According to Ben Rich, we have, the, we have the ability today to take ET home, which means we have the hardware. We're flying the stuff. It's very possible some of the UFOs that are seen are man-made. Now, John Andrews in, in June of 86, John Andrews was with Tester Corporation. They make model airplanes and cars and stuff. And he was a pen pal with Ben. Ben adored John Andrews and he adored me because we had a passion for what he had a passion for. And John wrote a letter to Ben Rich and he said, Ben, I have to ask you a question. Do you believe in UFOs? Now there are two categories, both man-made and extraterrestrial. And Ben came back on his own letterhead as president of the Lockheed Skunk Works. He said, both Kelly and I are firm believers in both categories. We refer to ours as unfunded opportunities, and he underlines the U, the F, and the O. He said, but beware, there are people who will lead, lead you astray and possibly do you harm. Ben told us that we refer to ours as unfunded opportunities. If you didn't fund it, if you didn't have to pay for it, if it was given to you or it crashed, and you recovered it, that's an unfunded opportunity. And in 1996, at a, uh, it was a graduate student gathering or convention of aeronautical engineers from UCLA. And their keynote speaker was Ben Rich. And Ben had been retired as president of the Skunk Works. And he's up there talking about what he, what he did for the 40 years he, you know, he worked with Kelly Johnson. And one of the last things he said, and, it's, and you can search it, on Google or Bing or whatever, it's, it's, it's there. Ben Rich told this audience in 1996, we have the ability to take ET home, but the government won't declassify the information. When Ben Rich was referring to the fact that we had the ability to take ET home, that means we can travel across the universe. 
I believe he said it because we have recovered crashed UFOs. We have been given UFOs and we have found abandoned UFOs. Now, one question has, has been raised repeatedly when you talk about issues about disclosure, right? UFO disclosure. And there's a very significant argument that the admission of something else out there can easily be used, let's say, by the military to justify, you know, further ballooning of the already massive military budget. You hear this a lot, and um, some people <clears throat> will talk about this in a totally pejorative way. They'll say, well, they're creating an alien threat where there isn't one uh, just to scare the public and justify all of this extra money being spent to either take your rights away or to just spend a lot of money on military. There's another way to look at it, which is that they might play it that way because there is a genuine threat. Like a lot of the folks who complain about the possibility of like a false flag or some kind of deception about uh, an alien threat, they, they're working off the assumption that the aliens are definitely not a threat or are definitely beneficial. And you know, where I stand on that is, I, I think that's, that's never been a, a rock solid assumption. There are people who believe that, I've just never been fully persuaded by the evidence that that's true. My own opinion is that, you know, at least based on the behaviors that we have recorded, okay, <clears throat> is that I actually think that there are multiple groups and there's more than one. And from the information that we are getting, there's at least reason to think that one of those groups does not have our best interests at heart and may actually be hostile to us. And you, I've heard this again and again and again. And indeed, when you look at the long history of military engagements with these things, they're not usually initiating overt hostilities, although there have been pilot deaths in connection with UFOs. And some of the engagements do actually seem like they're being hostile, but generally uh, they're just being provocative in one way or another. So at the, at the least you can say there's some kind of trouble out there in paradise between us and at least one group of them. And if you're a military person, you know, look, your job in the military is to defend your nation. That's your job. And if you've got even a potential threat in these other things, you have to, by your duty, you have to recognize that threat and you have to at least have a plan for dealing with them. That's just the reality. So does that mean they're gonna go false flagging us or are they gonna be legit? And look, I don't know. I don't have every answer here either. But uh, it's not illegitimate, at least, you know, a priori, it's on the face of it. It's not illegitimate to at least explore the possibility of the threat. That's my position. What uh, attracted you to physics? I started teaching, taught physics and astronomy here at Nebraska Omaha for 34 years. And during that time, uh, I also taught for 17 summers and for a number of uh, times during the year at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Livermore, California. I had a security clearance and I studied uh, the effects of nuclear weapons. I studied electromagnetic theory and nuclear theory, a bunch of different things. and. Uh, atmospheric physics, and I did that for 17 summers, and that was a, a big part of my research. I also got a grant to work for NASA. STS-48, September 13th, 1991. It appears there is something coming from the Earth's surface in response to an object entering the atmosphere. Soon after this footage was shot, Dr. Kasher wrote a full scientific analysis of the event. He submitted his findings to NASA and the public. I don't know what this thing is, but it's really a very interesting object too. Water dump attitude will take about 15 minutes, and in order to start the dump on time, we'd like for you to do that maneuver now. We need it to uh, prevent contamination. Okay, I understand you want us to start the uh, spy water. Depending on how far away from the shuttle they were, 
was um, an extraordinary thing to the extent that if they were 10 miles or farther from the shuttle, they behaved in ways that were vastly beyond anything that we can do on the Earth. Four NASA employees were given this to offer their opinion. They just watched the video. They did no analysis of it. And what they came up with was reasonable that it had to be ice particles, and that's as far as they took it. Did not say a single thing about, there were two streaks that went up through there, like you might expect from a missile. I was able to rule out at least five times, five different proofs that they were not ice particles. And if they weren't, the only other viable option is some kind of spacecraft. And the way it behaved, uh, again, I can't prove how far away it was from the shuttle. If it was a mile away, that's, that's unbelievably close. It's dangerous. If it's 10 miles away, uh, it, it accelerated in a fashion that was beyond anything that humans could stand, 100 Gs it would be, uh, which would uh, you know destroy a human being. And then if you start going out beyond 10 miles, uh, then we're talking about quantum leaps in technology beyond what we have. And, and so uh, to me, the logical conclusion is that these were spacecraft from somewhere else out in space away from the shuttle. And it's hard to explain those two streaks that went through there, uh, unless it is in terms of one good explanation might be that they were missiles that we might be firing at them, and that's a scary thing too. Dr. Jack Kasher is another perfect example of a NASA employee blowing the whistle on UFOs. As we continue into modern space exploration, NASA became more sophisticated in their approach at hiding what they were recording above and beyond. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, this is this completely still have any spacecraft uh, under a Do we have an unidentified flying object?